Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Witte. I am your host tonight. I'm filling in for my good friend uh, and Newport Public Library Foundation stalwart Gordon McAlpine, who couldn't be here tonight. But there's a reason for that. About a year ago, maybe it was a year ago, uh, I always like to talk to Gordon about books, and Gordon said, there's this book you should read called Redeployment which I bought and read, and I got so wrapped up in it, after I finished it, I called him and said, Gordon, you gotta read this book. He said, uh, I'm the one who recommended it to you. <laughs> in any event, um, and I think you'll understand why when you hear from Phil Cly, but I think most of you know, but uh, it's events like these, and it's your support that makes the Newport Public Library Foundation possible. Um, and this speaker series now going on, I think it's 18th year. Um, I want to thank Nespresso and Fashion Island for hosting tonight's coffee in the courtyard. Particularly given our speaker tonight, I'm certainly happy to welcome any military members who might be in attendance tonight. And tonight's book sales, which are courtesy of Laguna Beach Books, thank you, Laguna Beach Books, the 10% discount to any members of the military, of course, Mr. Cly will be signing books in the front of the room after the talk. I am obliged, the obligatory, please turn off your cell phones, no audio or video recording uh, of any kind. But a little bit about our, our speaker. Uh, Phil Cly is a graduate of Dartmouth College. Uh, somebody I was talking to recently said, he looks really young, and I said, I think that's because he is. But he's also a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. He served in Iraq's Anbar Providence from January 2007 to February 2008 as a public affairs officer. Now, after being discharged, he received his Master of Fine Arts from Hunter College. So right off the bat, military and Master of Fine Arts, a very interesting combination. He is the author of Redeployment, a powerful collection of short stories that takes readers to the front lines of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. In his book and public lectures, he explores the complex feelings of brutality, faith, guilt, and fear that a soldier experiences during war, while also revealing the isolation and despair that can accompany a soldier's homecoming. I was telling Phil earlier that after re while I was finishing the book, I began to forget, is this fact or fiction? Is this fiction or nonfiction? Really a very, very compelling set of stories. With his stark, realistic depictions of war, his book has been praised as, quote, one of the best debuts of the year by the Portland Oregonian, and author Karen Russell calls his writing searing and powerful unsparing of its characters and its readers. Redeployment won the 2014 National Book Award for Fiction and the 2015 Chautauqua Prize. Phil's writing has also appeared in the New York Times, Granta, Newsweek, The Daily Beast, The New York Daily News, Tin House, and The Best American Non-Required Reading, 2012. He is now spending a lot of time teaching and planning his next moves at Princeton University. And I want to say, before I call him up here, what I think has been particularly important about his writing is he's helped bridge the gap that, frankly, most of us have between the reality of what we read about in the paper every day in Iraq and Afghanistan, and actually serving there and conveying it in such a way uh, with such strong literary presence that much more than anything we could read in the daily papers. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Phil Cly. Thank you so much and, and thank, thanks to everybody for coming out. Um, what do you do? when a Marine tells you he can't get over his guilt over the suicide of a Marine he served with? What do you do when you learn that two of the Marine you serve with experience periods of homelessness after they left the Corps? When a friend learns that the translator he worked with in Iraq, who repeatedly risked his life for our troops and then was denied a visa to the United States, 
that that translator and his two eldest male children were executed by militants when they found out that he used to work for the Americans. When strangers at a bar insist on treating you as though you must be psychologically damaged just because you're a veteran, or when friends of yours who do indeed have post-traumatic stress find that they can't express their legitimate feelings of grief and rage without it being dismissed as a symptom. I don't know if any work of literature will be able to give you the answers to those questions, but it will at least allow you to start asking. I've met veterans from Vietnam, from Korea, from World War II. They haven't stopped asking themselves those sorts of questions since the day that we got home. And I really don't think that any of us are going to get more responsible about war as a country unless we all start asking ourselves those questions too. War is too strange to be processed alone. And whether we like it or not, we're all involved. If you voted for Bush, if you voted for Obama, if you're a taxpayer paying for the wars, or if you're somebody who doesn't follow the wars at all. And actually, I should probably say, especially if you're somebody who doesn't follow the wars at all. These are your wars just as much as they are any veterans. I met a Marine at an event recently. He was a big guy, tough-looking vet. He must have been the perfect image of a Marine in dress blues. He stood up and he said, I'm a Marine veteran of Iraq. That used to be something I was incredibly proud of. If you'd asked me just a few years ago to make a resume of my life, not a resume for a job, just a resume of who I was, what I was, all the biggest bullet points would have been Marine sergeant, combat veteran, led Marines in Iraq. But now I'm looking at what's happening in Iraq, and I'm starting to wonder what I was a part of and whether I can be proud of it. Was I part of an evil thing? Because if I was, then I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know what my identity is. Now, I remain proud of my service. And I think that that Marine can remain proud of, of his as well. But I get where he's coming from. I think any veteran who served in Iraq must be asking themselves some hard questions. I have friends who fought in the Battle of Fallujah only who lost Marines taking back that city only to watch it fall to ISIS. I have friends who fought in Mosul, and it goes on. I'm sure most Marines who served in the past decade plus have questions about their service and how their lives have been used. But here's the thing. It's not on them alone. It's not solely up to the 18-year-old who signs on the dotted line to join the Marine Corps that in addition to ensuring that he takes his training seriously, is able to look after the Marine on the left and the right of him, that he's capable of surviving and performing well in a combat zone, that he also, two years later, once he's finished all that, ensure that his country is providing him with thoughtful military policy and a sustainable strategy. That piece of the puzzle is a job for all of us. When it comes to war, they're the stories we should be telling ourselves and the stories we like to tell ourselves. And the difference is often measured in human lives. The body count in Iraq passed 100,000 a long time ago, after all, most of them Iraqi civilians. I think we need better stories. We need better stories and we need to have smart, critical conversations about those stories. We need stories of war and we need stories of homecoming. The stories we tell ourselves about war decide what we, as a society, will accept from our leaders and what we push them to do. They also decide how we think about and treat the young veterans in our communities. One thing I hear a lot from civilians is, I could never imagine what you've been through. Personally, I don't think it's very hard. My job wasn't that crazy. Aside from the occasional trip outside the wire, doing an especially newsworthy mission, or the very infrequent mortar attacks, it was mostly sitting at a plywood desk in the desert. I guess people mean they don't think they can understand war. So, since I've joined, I've done a lot of reading of a lot of veterans. I don't think we've figured it out either. So I would urge everyone to help us out. Join the conversation. It's a vital one, I promise you. And that, I guess, is why I write stories. Oh, 
Then the elements of a nine line are location, frequency, precedence, special equipment needed, number of patient security marking, NBC contamination, and patient nationality. Thank you very much.